going to be a good sermon this morning because I got two Bibles with me, right? Probably so you're going to be here for a while. No, I, got to, I want to share with you from uh, this other passage of Scripture, or, or Bible too, this morning because it's just a different uh, reference. And uh, I like it just uh, from the Amplified Bible. And uh, I find that it's just uh, an encouraging passage of Scripture to, for us to, to look at. And uh, this morning, we're going to begin uh, a study in, of Scripture that I, I consider probably one of the most important passages of Scripture that we have uh, available to us as believers. One of the reasons I consider it one of the most important is because it is a, is a, is a, it's a sermon that uh, Jesus uh, just delivered to his disciples. And uh, that was, I believe, was the whole purpose was to prepare them for, um, for them to be able to go out into the world. For them to be able to go out and to encounter and to endure all kinds of things that, uh, that the world would throw at them. And, and in lots of ways, that a world that would not be very favorable to their faith, to their what they to what they what they would be what would be preaching or proclaiming themselves. Um, it's a message that calls us to a faith that is that is far more than simple religious practice, uh, ritual, and uh, devotion. Anyone uh, can be religious. Anyone can attend church. Anyone can look like. Christian, anyone can do all those things, but what I believe Jesus is calling us to throughout the Sermon on the Mount is a message that is uh, far more than any just simple religious practice. So it's going beyond simple religion is what I've titled this section of Scripture. And what we're going to look at today is the first 12 verses. And in the first 12 verses, we really get an uh, introduction to, to what Jesus uh, is going to proclaim throughout the next couple chapters. And so, what he gives here, basically, in the first 12 verses, is an overview of what he's going to preach on. And uh, it's interesting, if you look at the, this whole Sermon on the Mount, it's full of, of stuff that, that uh, you know, I, can't even, I couldn't even imagine or even think of beginning to just go through the whole thing in one setting altogether. So, we're going to take quite a while, over the next little while, to get a, a better understanding of this Sermon on the Mount. And then the whole purpose of this is so that we can develop a way of life. We can develop a way of living that it reflects what Jesus requires of us as believers in Jesus, as believers in Him, as believers, as His disciples. So as we begin this, this passage of Scripture, let's begin with a word of prayer and then ask, and ask God to just give us uh, insight into this this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here in your house today. Lord, I know that there's many that are that are at home uh, because of the weather, and many that uh, are not here just to, uh, for fear of driving today. And Lord, I just pray that you just be with them today. If there's those that are away that are sick. I know that there's lots of flu uh, going through our, our congregation. Lord, I just pray that you just be with them today. Strengthen them and give them the health, the uh, quick health back uh, to, uh, to the regular uh, way of uh, living. Lord, I do pray that uh, you just be with us as we look into your word this morning. Help us to examine it. Help us to understand it. Uh, Lord, we pray your Holy Spirit's anointing upon us, that we would be, uh, have our ears open so that we would be sensitive to the message you have for us to hear this morning. And I pray for your Holy Spirit's anointing as I preach this word uh, to your people today. I pray for these things now in your son's precious name. Amen. So we'll, we'll divide these 12 verses into three areas, beginning with verses 3, for, three through 5. But before we do that, I want us to get look at a key word in the passage and uh, that we've seen uh, that Nathan read to us this morning, that word is blessed, or blessed. Um, you, you, it's a word that uh, I believe um, is very important for us to understand because it's a, it, it could be translated also as happy. I don't know if you've ever seen some modern translations. You might see that it says happy are those, or happy uh, is the person, or whatever, however they might translate here. And uh, it's, it's, it's happiness and blessing that uh, is deeper, though, than just the feeling of a moment. Like uh, when, when Team Canada wins the gold, or doesn't win the gold. You know, it's, if they won the gold, we'd be very happy, right? We'd be all joy, full, full, full of joy, and, and uh, our country, our land would be blessed because we have these young men that were able to win the gold medal, although that didn't happen in the third period of the game this last week, right? As many of you might have watched it or, or didn't watch it, I'm sure you heard about it. 
But uh, the Jewish listener would, uh, uh, would understand that it had a deeper meaning. And it, it was uh, not reliant upon circumstances. It wasn't reliant upon anything like um, that they might experience. So it wasn't based on how, what was going on around them or their surroundings. It was a joy uh, dependent upon the assurance of God's blessing. And it was, under, under, un, uh, it was undis, undisturbed by circumstances of the outside world. So as we look at this, do not be caught up by the world's definition of blessing or joy or happiness. Because it's a, the world's uh, version is very fleeting. It's very a moment. It's very, uh, you know, I'm happy because this is going on in my life. I'm happy because I got this job. I'm happy because I just got married. I'm happy because uh, I had a child. I'm happy because I got good grades. It's, it's not based on any of that kind of thing. It's based on a life that is connected, a relationship that is, that is tightly woven with God Almighty. So let's look at this passage of Scripture based on that. And we'll begin in verses 3-5 through five and look at the individual's heart personally. This first five verses is very much us. It's about who we are. It's about what's going on in our lives. It's about what we see going on around us uh, in, in the sense of, of what uh, is, is, uh, God is doing with us. So let's begin with verse 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now does that sound interesting? Blessed are the poor. We often stop there, right? Blessed are the poor. Happy are the poor. But it actually is more than just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because they shall inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is theirs, it says. Now, if, you were, if it was a physical thing, you, it would be different than a spiritual thing. But it's person, what we see here is the person recognizing, blessed are the person that recognizes that they are not, they have not arrived spiritually, that they don't have it all figured out spiritually. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who realize, yeah, I'm a sinner. You see the difference? It's not necessarily a physical thing, like we often read these passages of Scripture, and what it often is put up on, on walls to reflect the poor, or things like that, but it's the poor in spirit. Those who realize that, yeah, I'm a, I'm an, I'm a sinner lost in this world. And because you recognize that you are a sinner, and that you need Christ, then, the kingdom of heaven can be yours. We, re we were referring to the person who has recognized their, their state before coming to Jesus Christ. Their state before coming to faith in Christ. And then we go on to verse 4, and in verse 4 we read this, Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. When we lose those we love. Our hearts are broken, aren't they? We're filled with sadness. Um, when we feel lost and, and confused uh, and, and uh, so many other feelings that go on when we lose someone. This week we went to a funeral and it was probably one of the, one of the best funerals I've been to in a long time. Does it sound strange? It does sound strange, doesn't it? But it was one of the most worshipful experiences I've had in because the man that went on, uh, went, went on, was graduated, the one that is sleeping, was a believer. So the choir stood and sang and led the congregation in some wonderful, worshipful hymns or choruses. The preacher preached based on the fact that we know that we have a Savior. And that the man knew that who his Savior was. In fact, one of the most interesting things I've ever seen happen at a funeral is that they had they videotaped an interview with with uh, it was Aaron's father, and they interviewed him, and they had bits and pieces of his interview in there, and it was such a, a uplifting, encouraging testimony. You never think that you go to a funeral and experience that. Usually, funerals are full of sadness. And, and full of, 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 of tears, and there were tears, and there was sadness, but it was, it was encouraging to see the difference when you go to a funeral of a man that is, that is saved. 
But when we lose someone, it is that sadness. In this case, we see the natural progression from the last verse. Once we have come to the point we see how poor we are in spirit, we enter into a state of sadness for our lostness. It's a mourning for ourselves. It's a mourning for how we, how we realize that we need Jesus Christ in our lives. That we can't go on any further. That, we, that we're lost. That we're, our hearts are broken. Our, it's, it's full of sadness. So bl blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who realize that without Jesus, my life is lost. That without Jesus, I'm hopeless. Without Jesus, I can't go any further. And they will be comforted. Because it's at this point that God can come and, and bring comfort to those of, that He loves. And the grace for you as an individual. And then we go on into the section of Scripture and we, we go on to verse 5 and it says, Blessed are the gentle, or blessed are the meek. Because they will inherit the earth. Gentle and meek is not equal weakness and an inability. But rather, what we see described here is strength under control. See a slight difference? When we say today in the world that that person's meek, that person is, is uh, gentle, we think of someone that's sort of almost kind of just very standoffish or weak or, or, or you know, not, not strong. But the reality is here, what, what I believe what we see here is a, is a strength that is under control, a strength that is, that, is, that, is, that is there because of what Jesus Christ has done in our lives, because of what God has done through us, because of our realization that we are, we are lost in our sin, we're poor in spirit, that we're, and because of that we're broken hearted, and that God has come to us in, our, in, a, in, a, in love and given us the strength to be able to stand up and say, yes, I know who I am in Jesus Christ. Here we see a total surrender to the King of Kings. And we know that when we, are, we humble ourselves and put Christ first, we have an end result that is totally desirable. It is something that the world can never offer to us. It's a change in, in, total, in, in totally what, how we see how we live our lives in the world. We don't need to be first. We don't need to stand before everybody and, and be stronger and be taller and be the most beautiful, or, and all those kinds of things, we can be meek and, 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 and gentle in our strength that we find in Jesus Christ. It's an interesting, it's a beautiful picture here. What we see here is the individual becoming aware that, of what God desires to do in their lives. And it's a three-step three progression then. It's recognizing that we are spiritually bankrupt, and then, throw, then they are sorrowful for it, and then they begin to respond humbly to their teacher and Lord. It's a beautiful picture of what God is doing in our lives, what God can do in our lives, if we turn our lives over to Him. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the gentle, because they will inherit the kingdom of earth. But Jesus does not stop here. He desires them to understand whether they can have a genuine relationship with Him. So verse 6 changes gears. It from, goes from a perfect we are individually to our genuine relationship with with the Lord, in verse 6, it reads, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. We see here a person that needs to understand that they are dying without, true, without a true and right relationship with God. We hunger, we thirst for that relationship that is more meaningful. We hunger and thirst for that relationship that is genuine and real with God. It's not just something that we go simply to church and we simply go and we pray once in a while, we simply once in a while read our Bible. It's that genuine thirst that's hungering for what God can do in my life. You need to become a person who hungers and thirsts for nothing and for, and for nothing to keep you from, from walking with God. Nothing to get in the way of, of a relationship between you and your Savior. No longer can you just wander along just aimlessly. It's that whole desire to find that strength. As I was walking, sitting down, waiting for everybody to get, sort of get a little bit ready this morning before I went to dig our car out to get us to, up to church this morning, I, I flipped on the TV just as background noise. For some reason, I just can't stand quiet in the morning. I need to have some activity. 
And so I turned on TV and it was talking about a girl that would walk nine miles just to get water every day, twice a day. That's hunger and thirst. A desire to be able to live, a desire to be able to go forward, a desire to be able to, 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 to uh, care for her grandmother and to, to, be able to, to be able to eat and drink. It's recognizing that we can't go any further without God. It's a hunger and thirst. You ever been hungry? You ever been thirsty, so thirsty that you just can't, you know, you get almost shaky? You, know, you, you can't you get that headache? You know, um, yesterday we, we, we shoveled snow, I think, twice, maybe three times. Ardell shoveled once, I shoveled, er, Ardell and I shoveled together, and all of us did it together, actually. Me, Go, and Iris, and, and Maddie, we all got up in the morning, we shoveled snow in the morning, and then Matt, Ardell shoveled again a little later in the day, and then I shoveled again in the, a little later on in the day, and then this morning I got up and I had to shovel again because it all drifted back in. And you know, you're hungry. And I, on the way to church, I said, we have to get something to eat, because I don't think I can... I didn't think I could stand before you this morning without having some food in me because I was starting to get that, that shake, you know, that hunger. And uh, you ever have your stomach growl and, and you know all those kinds of things or you get so thirsty that, that you know that, you, that uh, you just can't function anymore? Well, that's what we should be like when, when we, when we, we uh, look for, right, our, for righteousness in God. We have that desire to, we have such a hunger and thirst that we can't go any further, that we can't stand alone, that we... That we all, you know, it's like that, that just that whole, our mouth just, just has to have something in it. You know, it's that, oh, you know, that total need for Christ. A real genuine relationship. We need to be diligently searching for that right relationship with God so that He can, he can completely fill us with Himself and with His Spirit. Which leads us down to the last couple verses here in verses 7 through 12. And it's our relationship with others is reflected in this, in these ones. So first we see what we need as an individual in, with our walk with God. And then we see what we need to have that genuine relationship with God, that deeper relationship with God. So now we go on to how we need to have our, have our relationship with others in verses 7 through 12. Again in verse 7 it says, Blessed are the merciful, because they will be shown mercy. Here we're talking about a person that is others-oriented. Understand that, that what that means? So some of us are self-oriented. This is a person that is others-oriented. They, they look at others, they see, a, they see others, and they see a difference. They see how they need to be. Because of what we have experienced in Jesus Christ, we must see all, all others around us in a different way. We can't see them as the world sees them. We can't look at them based on their status based on their abilities, based on their looks, based on their amount of money. We can't look at any of those things the way the world looks at them. We have a, a different look. We, have, we see them through the eyes of Jesus Christ. What we have received, we should give to others, right? That mercy, that grace, that love, that acceptance, that caring, that willingness to give beyond our ability to give. That willingness to sacrifice ourselves for them without even considering yourself. Blessed are the merciful. Today I didn't show mercy very well. We we're driving in, and you know, driving into this community, I was so thankful that the, the, our parking lot was, was clear today. Um, a couple weeks ago when we had that first big snow, I drove in with my little car and it took me a half hour to just to get into the park and look up into the parking stall and then I was panicking. I kind of figured I'd better go park somewhere else and then it took me another half hour to get out. But uh, this, today, I wasn't showing mercy. I, I, I wasn't a good example. I'm not a good illustration for the sermon this morning because I drove up here and, and uh, I met another car so I said, okay, I'll turn up the street. And I turned up the street, got halfway down the street and this guy turns on to the street, I was on, and you know, there's, these, are, these are huge ruts, right? There was no way I could get up, there's cars on either side of me, and he comes all the way up to me, and he, and he stops. And I said to Ardell, I'm not moving. <laughs> this was not a merciful moment. I put the car in park, and I put my hands like this, and I said, He's gonna, I'm going to wait for him to move, and if I need to, I'll park, and I'll walk to church. That's how, how unmerciful I was this morning. That's not what we're talking about today. It's a bad example. I wasn't, as your pastor, a good example this morning of mercy. 
And you know, if I, but I, and then I, to my defense, there was another car behind me, so I couldn't back up. I had nowhere to go. So, but uh, that's not what he's talking about. It's here that we need to change that attitude within us. We need to have that willingness to to surrender, to be merciful, to show the mercy that Christ has shown us. And then we go on in verse eight. It says, "Blessed are the pure in heart, because they will see God." Pure. What does pure mean? Pure equals clean. It implies a singleness of purpose without distraction. It's all, we are focused. Blessed are those who are focused, for they shall see. Uh, verse not eight, right? But, so they shall see God. An individual with an undivided heart for God's call for their on their life. Nothing will keep them from following God. Not strife. Not poor, being poor, not being hungry, not being thirsty, not having the means. It's total undivided focus upon God. Nothing gets in the way of us going forward. They're able to see God. What does that mean? Well, it might mean that the, the ability to understand the heart and, and, of, of God and, and in your life. Or it also can mean only the pure heart can enter heaven. So those who have their defined, undivided attention upon God, and those that have their undivided attention upon His call in your life, that don't get sidetracked, don't go this way, that way, and then, you know, are all over the place. They are focused on what God has called them to, and they're able to stay on that focus, and because of that, they're able to see what God would have them do in their life. You ever feel like you just have no idea what God wants you to do in your life? Could it be that maybe that you're too, uh, too distracted by all the other things going on around you? All the other things that people are saying, or what this person is telling you, what that person is telling you, what that preacher is telling you, what that preacher is telling you. No, you, you, you get on that focus on God, you know what He has he's called to you, you to do, and you say, I'm not going to get on the sidetrack, I'm going to stay focused on Him. And as a result, you're able to see God and see what He desires for you. Wouldn't that be an awesome place to be? Pure, clean, before God. Because of time, I want to continue pushing on here. We go on to verse 9, and it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, because they are called the sons of God. Now, when I was younger, I don't know what, where this came from, but it, it creates a problem for me whenever I read this, this passage of Scripture. And I'll remember, blessed are the cheesemakers. And, I, and I, it's a, I don't know where that came from, but it, every time I read this, it, that's what comes to mind. So I always get a little smile on my face. So if you saw a little smile there for a second, it has nothing to do with the passage. It's just what, what comes to mind. But uh, now I, I've ruined you for this little passage for you too. So every time you hear the passage, blessed are the peacemakers, you'll hear cheesemakers. But it's blessed, blessed are the peacemakers, because they will be called the sons of God. Interesting, eh? I don't know why this is good that. Maybe there's some talk. <laughs> Peace here must be must be seen as internal and a spiritual peace. It's not necessarily what we think of in the world today. It's not the peacemakers, you know, the, the uh, peacekeepers. It's a different thing altogether. Um, it's peace within us. So blessed are those who create peace, those who bring peace to, the, to, to one another. Peace around the world will only come as men and women give their lives totally to Jesus Christ. It can only come from you want to see peace in the world today? And you know, it might be that we just need to turn this. this Your part. battery might be dead. Uh, okay. You know, it, it's not about peace in the sense of, of that, you know, of what the world would see in war, things like that. It's peace in the sense of what God is doing in our lives. And if you want to see, if you want to see peace around us, it needs to come here first. And then we go on to verse 10 and 12. And it's interesting that Jesus spends most time here than all the rest of them. 10 through 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, 
because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are you when they ins insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is, in, is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Persecution because of righteousness and because of Jesus. Not because of any cause or because of life is just not fair. But for those actively pursuing true righteousness. True relationship with God. Jesus gives more time here because it, I, I'm sure that he understood the world would not tolerate, tolerate any of those who would be his true followers. And I believe this is the mark of anyone who is a true servant of Jesus Christ. But be glad and rejoice. Take courage. Be strong. It's worth it. You know, you may face struggles, you may face difficulties because of your faith. You may have people that, that laugh at you because you're a Christian who say, what a, what a foolish thing to do because of uh, uh, because you made a decision to follow Christ. Or worse, you may face more difficulties. And I want to share a little bit with you this morning from a, from a passage in the book that I just finished, finished this week called Learning to Soar. And it talks, the author talks about a man that he met, uh, Avery Willis was a, a missionary and he, and he was in, spent some time in uh, this country where this other individual is from. He says, on one hot day in May, Abdul was walking along the road when he heard a man in a rickshaw asking, at a rickshaw, ask in his language, hey brother, would you like to ride with me? Abdul thought, oh, there's no one else here. This, this man talking to me. Now, Abdul had been, had been cast out from his family, been told that he had to go and live in the back of the house in the shed, and the only contact that he had with anybody was his mom bringing his meals. He told me, I, had, I answered yes, and nobody would talk, to, nobody talked to me, yet this man called me brother. I, I got in the rickshaw, and he, and he was so nice, just so good. I was a condemned man. No one wanted to talk to talk with me. I thought, why is he so good? I wondered if this man was a man or an angel. So I touched his hand and again, again, again and again to be sure he was a man. Now it tells us who the man was. The man was a missionary in, in this country. And he goes and he shares his faith with, with uh, young, this young boy. And he accepts Christ as Savior on the spot. After Abdul became a Christian, he told his family, and they were very upset with him, and his father and uncles beat him. Before daybreak, the next morning, his mother gave him some money and told him, Son, you must run because they're going to kill you. Now that's persecution. One day as a Christian, and your brother, or your father and your uncles beat you and decide to kill you. Abdul fled the capital country and found a church and was baptized. After he finished college, Abdul heard God call him back to the village of his youth. His, his banishment from home still firmly in place, Abdul stayed with a childhood friend. Abdul told the rest of his story. I had my Quran and my Bible with me, and every night I shared with my friend. Within three months, he accepted Christ and was ready for baptism. Then his parents found out and were upset with me. That afternoon, they forcibly took me to the soccer field, and they tied my hands behind me. They asked me, asked me about Jesus. Somebody kicked me in, in, with, the, with his boot. Somebody else hit me. Everyone spit on me, until my whole body was covered by spit. I remember when Jesus was crucified and prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Please, God, help them, save them, and forgive them. They left Abdul for dead. But this new convert came and released him from his bonds. He began, he begged Abdul to baptize him, despite the torture he had just witnessed. When Abdul told him that he didn't know where he, what he was asking, his friend replied, I don't, I don't, if you don't baptize me, you're a hypocrite. So the next morning, Abdul baptized him, and as they left the river, Abdul said, Thank you, God. Yesterday afternoon I was beaten, and was the only Christian in the village. But today there are two, 
Tomorrow we can have 200. The day, the day after, we can have 2,000. God, if you want it, yes. Reflecting on the situation, Abdul said, I think God listened. He listened to my prayer that day. Then he said, Today, in that village, we have 1,600 believers. All of whom had spit on them. But today, all of them are believers. Abdul's mom had passed away by this time, and but praise God, he goes on to say that his father received Christ as well after he shared his faith. Persecution. Rejoice, be glad. Be strong, be courageous. Avery Wills goes on and says, When I met Abdul eight years later, we had verified on the ground research that the moment that 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 that, that, that moment had grown to almost four thousand churches with ninety-three thousand baptized believers. The week before I met Abdul, his first convert, Belial, had been martyred. This man had discipled the leader of, of the house churches, taking nine to twelve to uh, take, taking nine to twelve to live with him for three months at a time. Given his life for the church. Not for the church. For his sake. He told me although nine leaders had been martyred, they had grown to 9,700 house churches and more than 450,000 baptized believers in less than 10 years. What can God do? With a believer that has totally given his individual life to Christ. Who said, I realize I'm a sinner. I realize that I'm so lost. I'm, I'm so broken hearted that I, I, I've, done, I, I've lost without Christ. And who comes and says, Lord, come into my life. I want a genuine relationship with you. I'm going to hunger and thirst for you. I'm going to show the mercy that you've shown me to others. See, Abdul, he could have just walked away from that. He could have left. He could have said, no more for me. I don't need this. I don't need to be beaten. I don't need to be spit upon. I don't need to be kicked. I don't need to, to be turned away by my family. I don't need to have all these terrible things to go. I could run away. I could leave. I could, I could go farther away. I could go somewhere around being accepted. Coming to faith in Jesus Christ has been the best thing, I think, of all the things I've ever done. Has it been easy? No, not all the time. Is it, it, has it been good times? Yes, but it has been bad times. It's had its ups and its downs, its victories and its defeats, its joys and its heartache. But I have done no other, any other way. Would I have done some things differently? Absolutely. I wish I could have told you the benefit of total surrender. I wish, I, I wish someone would have told me rather the benefit of total surrender, the blessing of hunger and thirsting after His righteousness, and maybe I would have well, said, I should say, I wish I would listen better. Will you be a better listener and take hold of what God has for you? Don't wait until your life has passed you by. Don't let the let this opportunity sail pass. Take hold of the blessing God is offering to you. Don't let these opportunities, these moments slip by you. Don't let, let, let a great possibility turn into wishing that you had a great, taking that great possibility. God has some amazing things for you to do. I believe every one of you here this morning. God has opportunities that He's placed upon for you. Maybe that opportunity today is for you to see Christ for that first time. Maybe that opportunity for you is to say, I'm going to be baptized. I'm going to receive, I have received Christ. I'm going to take that opportunity. I'm going to take that chance. I'm going to, I may be beaten. I may be turned away. I may be disowned. But if this is what God's called me to do, I'm going to do it. Maybe it's 
God's called you to, to surrender to ministry. Maybe he's called you to surrender to the mission field. Maybe he's called you to surrender in your life and go and just tell others around you that you meet every day that Jesus Christ has something for them in their lives. What is it that God has called you? And when those opportunities, when people come and they laugh at you, when they, when they scorn you, when they give you a hard time, you'll realize that it was worth it. You'll come to a point where you, you, you turn and you open the passage of Scripture to, to Matthew chapter 5, and you'll read it from like this. Verse 3, Blessed, happy, to be envied, and spiritually prosperous, with, with light, joy, and satisfaction, God's favor and salvation, regardless of of their outward conditions are the poor in spirit. In humble, in, in, in poor in spirit, the humble who rate themselves insignificant for their for their kingdom of heaven. Blessed and enviable, happy with with the happiness produced by, by the experience of God's favor, especially the condition by the revelation of his matchless grace, are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed, happy, blissome. Joy, joyous and uh, spiritually prosperous with light, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward condition, are the meek, the mild, patient, long-suffering. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in the state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. Blessed, happy, to be envied, and spiritually prosperous with light joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward condition, are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed, happy, enviable, fortunate, and spiritually prosperous, prospering the possessing the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor and especially, especially conditioned by the revelation of His grace, regardless of their outward condition, are the pure at heart, for they shall see God. Blessed, enjoy, enviable happiness, spiritual prosperity, with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward condition, are the, are the makers and maintainers of peace. For they are called the sons of God. Blessed and happy, and enviable fortune and spiritual prosperity, prosperous, are the born again child of God, who enjoys and finds satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of his outward condition, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for, be, for doing, being and doing right for their kingdom of heaven. For, the, for theirs the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> Blessed, happy are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you and falsely on my account. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When you think that you have a bet, remember those who have gone before you. Men like Abdul. Men like Washington Iskander. And many others like that. Hard time. 